Right, our next speaker has already been introduced and um, probably needs no introduction anyway because I suspect many of you in this uh, conference today, like me, feel that Robert Whitaker is one of the people, no, is the person who has spearheaded a growing awareness amongst the public of some of these critical debates about psychiatric medication that the public has been deprived of for so many years. So it's always a great pleasure to meet with um, Robert and to listen to him speak. Over to you. Uh, I just, is this on? All right. <laughs> I just want to reiterate something I said this morning. Uh, it's really a it's both an honor and quite humbling to be speaking particularly twice here. Uh, because when I first uh, sort of got into this whole subject, I will tell you how much I went to school on the work that was being done in Britain some the, by the Critical Psychiatry Network. You're very lucky to have people like Hugh Middleton and Sammy and Joanne Moncrief. You have a lot, of, and now the new council. You're a lucky population for having this sort of debate, so it is really an honor to be here. What I hope to do with ADHD, in some ways, it's going to bring together a couple topics. What James was talking about with uh, DSM-3, which was published in 1980, one of our new diagnoses was attention deficit disorder for the first time. So we began, there was something called minimal brain dysfunction that they prescribed. Um, Ritalin stimulants for prior to 1980. And you sometimes, but it was still a small number of people. Now, as you saw with James's uh, presentation, basically what happened in 1980 when the American Psychiatric Association decided to make this big switch, where they'd say these are medical disorders, it wasn't that there was science behind the creation of these new disorders, but literally people got together and said, we'll construct a new disorder. And in some ways, I think, and I don't know this for sure, but one of the reasons for the construction of attention deficit disorder is they already were starting to use stimulants, and this would both broaden that market and supposedly legitimize it. So anyway, in 1980, we get attention deficit disorder for the first time. There's no scientific discovery. There's nothing that these kids have something biologically different about them. And you really should go into the DSM even today and see what the symptoms are. The symptoms are, you know, you tap your fingers too much, you talk too much in class, you don't always, and we're talking about six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. Uh, you'll see, often fails to finish things, he or she starts, often acts before thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a little ridiculous. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying, look at the symptoms, and you'll see that it can characterize almost any child, and then you're trying to figure out, well, when does it become abnormal? And really, it becomes abnormal if you're annoying to the teacher in your class. <laughs> and in the United States, at least, we, do all, we often have screening for this. And teachers are taught to make the diagnosis. And so often, the diagnosis uh, arises with a complaint from the teacher, your kid's not behaving well enough. Now, in 1980, when they first do it, they said, well, maybe about 3% of children have ADD. Then you heard that we got a, a new edition in 1994. And one of the things that happened, it's not just that you get new diagnoses when they do these updated editions. <clears throat> they'll make it easier. They'll have a diagnosis, and then they'll change the criteria for making the diagnosis that makes it easier to make the diagnosis. They'll loosen it or say you don't, they'll create different subtypes. And so in 1994, what happened is they made changes to the diagnostic criteria that in their own study said, well, we'll now diagnose another 25% of kids, okay, because we're going to broaden the criteria. Now, one of the people who was on the task force in, for uh, creating child pediatric disorders at dsm 4 was someone named Joseph Biederman. And as soon as this uh, manual gets published, he becomes a publishing machine. He begins publishing new articles at the rate of about one every two weeks, the fastest scientist in America. <laughs> and he has kept this up for about 15 years. It's really remarkable. Uh, so what did his new article say? This is a validated disorder. It's real. That's number one. And if you don't give them stimulants, they're going to have bad outcomes. 
Okay, and all of a sudden, so we now have a, and he's from the Massachusetts General Hospital. He's a professor at psychiatry from Harvard. So now we now have someone with great legitimacy in American society saying, it's real, it's valid, and if you don't medicate your kids, they're gonna have really bad outcomes. He now starts saying, in truth, it's six to nine percent. Okay, so, uh, uh, expanding the market. So what happens now? What happens now? We now have a market big enough for drug companies to bring new stimulants to market. Six to nine percent of kids is a pretty big market. We get new <coughs> drugs to market. They begin advertising it. More and more kids get diagnosed. And we're now up to 13 percent of our children diagnosed with ADHD. My point is, oh, by the way, most diagnoses do arise from teacher complaints. Not from, as only a minority of children with a disorder exhibit symptoms through a physician's office visit. Now, Peter's told me I need to go back to this. Um, one of the real interesting studies done by Canadians, they found that if you're the youngest kid in the class, you're much more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than the oldest children, meaning main, basically it's a maturation issue. And what Peter was telling me yesterday, the actual study is 50%, not 30%. I somehow got that wrong. So it's even worse than what I'm saying here. So there's two ways to look at this. Pre-1980, we didn't have it. Now we have 13%. One, if you would talk to ADHD experts, this is a story of progress. This is a story of a disease that went under-recognized and untreated. And now, fortunately, all these kids are getting treated. Uh, from a pharmaceutical point of view, this is a creation of a market and a very successful creation of a market. Now, in the 1990s, we were the first country to do this. In the early 1990s, I think Americans were consuming about 95% of the world's production of methylphenidate, which is Ritalin. And many uh, uh, doctors, psychiatrists in other countries said, oh, you crazy Americans, medicating your kids. But fortunately, no, not fortunately, amazingly, we still have now successfully exported this belief system to countries around the world. And one of the ways we've exported this is this. If you go to the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, about half the psychiatrists are from other countries. And they go to those meetings with grants from the pharmaceutical companies. They don't pay themselves. And you go to these meetings, and you have a nice breakfast at a symposium sponsored by a manufacturer of a stimulant, or a nice lunch, or a nice dinner. And at these um, forums, for many, many years, you would have these very famous child psychiatrists give talks from Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, about how this is a validated disorder and you need to medicate. Now, one of the things is they're presented as scientific symposiums, but of course these people, in fact, are consultants and speakers to the drug companies. And they rehearse their speeches beforehand, okay? This is the man that did more than any single psychiatrist in the world to really uh, expand the market for ADHD drugs. And then subsequently, he, he built a new market for atypical antipsychotics in kids by saying they had bipolar disorder. So I looked at the number of companies he uh, had to disclose he had worked for in this 15-year period. He'd worked for more than 24 companies. He's worked for every single company that manufactures stimulants. One company alone, Janssen gave him $1.6 million. So he is a highly paid consultant. In some ways, I'd say he's underpaid, even if it's 20 million or whatever it is, because he's created a worldwide market for stimulants. So the next question is, you'll often hear, at least in the United States, that it's a real disorder. It's, it's, it's a disease. And that 5% of kids have abnormal brains or something like that. And may, sometimes you'll see a scan. This is the ADHD scan brain, and this is the non-scan, the normal brain. So it's presented to us as a disease, as a pathological real disease. But let's see if they've really found that. Have they found that the, quote, ADHD brain is different than the non-ADHD brain? 1991, <laughs> attempts to define a biological basis have been consistently unsuccessful. The neuroanatomy of the brain, as demonstrated by imaging studies, is normal. 1997, stimulants up dopamine, so they began looking. Maybe ADHD kids don't have enough dopamine. And you'll see efforts, this is a textbook. Efforts to identify a selective neurochemical imbalance in ADHD children, been disappointing. They didn't find a chemical imbalance. 
They had a, a conference on this in 1998. What'd they say? This is the NIMH. They're bringing together all the experts. We've been doing this for years. Our knowledge about the cause or causes of ADHD remain largely speculative. Even while if you ask parents, they're told this is real. And in fact, one of the things that happens in the United States, and I do not know how it is in the UK, a teacher will make a complaint. Their kid's talking too much in class or whatever. The parents will be called in, and they'll basically be often given this story, it's a real disorder, and one of the things they're sometimes told is, if your kid had diabetes, wouldn't you not give them insulin? It's sort of a shaming thing. So it's used in that way. You, they need treatment for a disease. But if you go to the science, they're not finding the biology. Now, more recently, you often do see, they'll, they'll put up a slide of an imaging study, and they'll say, they'll scan 20 ADHD kids and com create a composite, 20 normal kids create a composite, and when they show it to you, it seems like they're lit up differently, okay? And that's supposed to be the proof. So the American Psychiatric Association put together a work group on neuroimaging markers of psychiatric disorders and looked at ADHD, and they said, first of all, we don't know of any difference that allows us to take a scan of a kid at risk of being ADHD and saying that's an ADHD brain. That's the first. But here's the real kicker. They're not scanning unmedicated kids. They're scanning medicated kids. So literally what you have is scans of kids on Ritalin or stimulant and scans of kids not on Ritalin and on a Ritalin. So what do you think? A, a, kid, on a, a kid on a drug is going to be, his brain's going to be working differently, right? So here it is. We got this disorder in 1980. We've been told there's this biology, and this is an American Psychiatric Association task force. To our knowledge, no controlled trials have examined the effect of stimulant medication on structural brain abnormalities in youth with ADHD. I love this. Suggesting a critical area for future research. <laughs> Meaning, if we're really going to do this, we should be uh, investigating unmedicated kids and never medicated kids, because obviously the drugs change people. So where are we in 2014? You still have these symptoms. You can see their behavioral symptoms. But we don't have any biology that separates the ADHD brain you know, as if this is from the non-ADHD brain. So that's part one. Second, sort of to repeat what we did this morning, we need to ask how do the drugs uh, act on the brain? And then how does the brain respond to the drug? So if you take Ritalin, methylphenidate, what happens is, again, so dopamine gets released into that tiny gap between neurons, and then it has to go back up to end the message, right? You have to remove that molecule from the synaptic uh, cleft. And one of the ways that you remove it is you take that molecule, it goes back up into the presynaptic neuron, all right? That's the normal process. What a stimulant like methylphenidate does, it blocks that reuptake process. So now the dopamine stays longer in that gap between the, the, the neurons, and it ups dopaminergic activity. Now, what does cocaine do? Exactly the same thing. And when they had a um, work done by our National Institute of Drug Abuse, they even looked at the potency of methylphenidate versus cocaine, and they blocked this reuptake process with the same potency. The one difference is, is that cocaine clears the body more quickly than methylphenidate. So actually, methylphenidate is basically long-lasting cocaine. All right? I mean, in terms of the mechanism of action, it's doing the same thing on the brain. And the person you can read on this is named Nora Volkow. You can look at her research. So what we talked about this morning, you have a drug now that ups dopaminergic activity. What's your brain going to do? What's the compensatory adaptation? The presynaptic neurons are going to put out less dopamine than normal for a period of time. It's going to try to dial down its dopaminergic uh, machinery. And at least from animal studies, there's evidence that you're going to decrease the number of receptors for dopamine in the brain. So what you're going to do is you're going to create a, a physiologically a dopaminergic system that acts in a subsensitive manner, okay? And again, you have a drug that acts as an accelerator, your brain's going to put down the brake on that activity. It's trying to maintain its normal functioning, its homoecstatic equilibrium. And one of the things here that I've said here today with this one molecule idea, you have a dopamine or serotonin. The brain, of course, is much more complex than that. The serotonergic systems interact with dopaminergic systems. So if you really try to uh, 
identify the changes in the brain of a child going on methylphenidate or a stimulant, it's not just the dopaminergic system that gets changed, you get changes in these other systems as well. So I think you can see at the very least, going on a stimulant for a child is a profound thing. You're going to change that brain. Now one of the things that, uh, of course, you want to ask in children, so they go on, they have these changes, then they come off Ritalin, say, a couple years later, will their brain renormalize? And the answer is we don't know. Okay? But in a study with rats, and rats' brains are different, of course, um, that they were, what they did is they take rats that haven't hit puberty yet, and I think rats hit puberty at about day 45 or something like that. <laughs> but they put them on methyl phenidate at a dosage that's appropriate for the body weight of that rat for two weeks. Now they take that rat uh, off methyl phenidate, and then they let it grow to an adult rat, and then they sacrifice the rat, and they looked at the density of dopamine uh, res receptors in the brain, and they find it's abnormally low. So in other words, at least in the rat model, this receptor density is not um, uh, normalizing. And you'll see that persisted into adulthood. Okay, now let's go through the evidence for the drugs if we're helping these kids. And by 1995, and this is, I think, pretty true, at least over the short term, a couple weeks, you give a kid a stimulant, it will change his behavior. The kid will move around less, and, and he'll fidget less, he'll tap his fingers less, he will initiate social interaction less, he'll talk less, that sort of thing. And so on scales for ADHD symptoms, which I still like to think are a scale, how much do I annoy the teacher, they become less, uh, they behave in ways that are seen as better. They, they, they cut down um, this physical activity. You have to ask, of course, is this cut down in physical activity necessarily good for the child? And here's what some uh, psychologists noticed when they were giving uh, stimulants to children in terms of just looking at their behavior. What happened to that child? Not just at the physical movement, but what happened to him? And what do you see? More solitary play. They initiate uh, contact with other children less. Seems to reduce their curiosity about the environment. They often become passive, submissive, and socially withdrawn. And then in 19, uh, this Oxford textbook, I think is 1998, something like that, they look about, so what do stimulants do? They curb hyperactivity by, quote, reducing the number of behavioral responses to your environment. My point to this is this. On scales that measure ADHD symptoms, there's no question that you get a, a reduction in those ADHD symptoms over the short term. But you still have to ask, is that good for the child in this global way? And this is a different way of asking, answering that same question. Is it better that the child has a reduced curiosity, becomes more socially withdrawn, et cetera? And one of the things that I think happens in clinical drug trials when they say efficacy, you say, there's some sort of objective proof that has been obtained. But of course, scales have subjective values in them, especially when you're talking about behavior. How about? Do they improve academic achievement? There is some sense that the kids will focus better on sort of routine activities like doing arithmetic problems, at least over the short term. But reasoning, problem solving, and learning, no. Vocabulary, reading, math, well, even math. A reduction in commitment of the sort that would seem critical for learning. An improvement in classroom manageability rather than academic performance. So again, initially, they were not finding that this was helping kids in the classroom. All right. Now, by 1994, uh, we had been using these drugs for almost 20 years, but it, we had the diagnosis for 14 years. And you can go to the American Psychiatric Association textbook, and they said, what have we learned now about how this affects kids over longer periods of time? Does it help that 7-year-old become an, a successful 20-year-old, or that 9-year-old become a successful college student? And you say, at this time, we do not have evidence that they pr uh, produce improvements in aggressivity, conduct disorder, criminality, education achievement, job functioning, marital relationships, or long-term adjustments. So 14 years in, no evidence we're helping that kid long-term. In response to this, the National Institute of Mental Health mounted a clinical trial known, the M known as the 
the abbreviated form is the MTA study of children with ADHD. Now, the NIMH, again, is our premier agency for studying mental health problems. When they mounted this trial, they said, this is the first well-designed trial to study a child psychiatric disorder. They said, up to this point, we have no evidence that stimulant medication has been de demonstrated to have a benefit for any domain of child functioning. So this is going to be the study that lets us know, are we helping these kids? So here's the study. They randomized them to one of four groups. Medication alone as prescribed by experts, behavioral therapy, medication prescribed by experts plus behavioral therapy, or medication prescribed by community doctors. By the way, this is, there is a tiny thing here. There is a bias against the behavioral therapy here. What happens is, if you're in the drug therapy alone, you get to see your doctor for 14 months in the first 14 months, so you have regular visits. If you're behavioral therapy, I think it's only five months, and then they cut it off. So if just visiting a doctor is helpful, that therapeutic alliance, you don't get it as long in the behavioral group, okay? Anyway, at the end of 14 months, what do they report? When medications are prescribed by the experts, you get a greater reduction in ADHD symptoms at 14 months. And it also seems like maybe there's a benefit on reading as well, okay? That was what was announced. And now they said, we finally have long-term evidence the drugs help. It's this study. And they say, they conclude, since we now have this evidence, the disorder is a chronic disorder. You don't get rid of ADHD. It's not quite true, but anyway. And beha kids' behavior actually does change over time. Um, but now they're saying, <laughs> It's quite an amazing thing. The six-year-old's not always the nine-year-old's, not always the 12-year-old. But anyway, ongoing treatment often seems necessary. So this now becomes the evidence base for long-term use of the drugs, OK? And I forget if I include this slide. If you're a, a parent today in the United States, and you're told your kid has uh, ADHD, and you go on the internet to see, well, should I medicate them? One of the places you'll land is on a website uh, put together by the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, in other words, our best, our most famous child psychiatrist, and they will quote this, this study result to say, this is how we know the drugs provide a long-term benefit. But this is not the end of the study. The study continues. It's gonna continue three years, six years, eight years. Now after this, it's just gonna be a naturalistic study. If you've been on meds, you can come off. If you've been on behavior, you can go on. Um, and now they're just going to see how you do on meds long term, okay? This finding is what happened after 36 months. By the way, you will not find this finding in the abstract, uh, but if you read carefully, when they compare medicated and unmedicated patients, here's what you will find, and I'll let you read it. How many of you have heard of this finding? A few of you have. Bob's heard me speak before. I don't know. The point is, this finding is not publicized like the 14-month finding, right? And it's not even in the abstract. They actually spin the abstract to make it seem like the medicated kids are doing fine, too. Here's what happened to spin it. At 36 months, the kids on medication are still doing better than they were on these ADHD scales than at baseline, OK? So if you compare to baseline, they're still doing better. What's happening is the kids off medication are even doing much better. That's the relative deterioration, okay? So they basically say, hey, all our kids are getting better. Nevertheless, if you now go behind the scenes, they're meeting and they're upset. They're trying to explain why are the medicated kids doing worse. And they try to cut the data all different ways. And one of the things, if you really read this closely, they're saying maybe the reason for the worse outcomes for the kids on medication is they're the ones with more severe symptoms at the beginning. Say, look at that. It was not true. If anything, it was the opposite. So what they find here is they can't explain away the poor findings of the drug. And what do they say? Long-term benefits were not documented. Selection bias did not account for the loss of relative superiority. There was no evidence for catch-up growth. The, the medicated kids were smaller. And early treatment did not protect against later adverse outcomes. Here's the six-year results. We're talking about kids here, right? We're talking about kids. By the way, no kid gives informed consent. Informed consent is supposed to be at the heart of medicine. Kids are not giving informed consent. The parents 
I'd say, are giving uninformed consent if they don't know about this. Anyway, you can see, they're still doing worse, right? Now, when these results, when this data was analyzed, and we actually have two groups of investigators. We have some psychologists and we have some psychiatrists on this. There are uh, some documentation that they got into a big fight whether they would even report this. The psychiatrists did not want it reported. The psychologists did. And there's still some sense that maybe they spun the data a bit to not make it look so bad. William Pelham is a psychologist. Here's what he said when he came to London one day. By the way, he will not announce this in the United States. He will not be so definitive because he was worried about, I think, his research funding being cut. We had thought, this is what they expected, that children medicated longer would have better outcomes. That didn't happen to be the case. There were no beneficial effects, none. In the short term, medication will help the child behave better. In the long run, it won't. And that information should be made very clear to parents. So every once in a while, I'm asked to give an ADHD talk to uh, you know, regular groups, non-professional groups. The parents come, and I'll say, how many of you were informed this when you medicated your kid? He just put up this, zero. That's how many hands go up. This is the point. They're not told this. This is not made clear. And my whole thing as a, uh, from my point of view is, again, societies need to have a full, uh, you know, this is this big study. Societies need to know this information, and parents need to know this information. Otherwise, you don't have informed consent either at a societal level or an individual level. So my complaint is this should be known. Anyway, now going forward, that that's still the main study, but just let's look at the other literature. Canadians did 14 studies. Can we find evidence for improved academic performance? No. That's what they called long-term three months. This was a big study, done, review of the literature done by Oregon Health and Science University. This is actually a review project that brings together researchers from, I think it's 13 universities who do not take money from the drug companies. What did they find? 2,200 studies, by the way, which are told to the American public is this is why you have to take the drugs. No, but they actually look at the quality. There is no good quality evidence on the use of these drugs to affect outcomes relating to global academic performance, consequences of risky behavior, social achievements. In other words, they can't find that evidence. And by the way, all the bias in these studies is towards finding the evidence. Here's a long-term study by Western Australia. What did they find? The medicated kids were 10 times more likely than the unmedicated children with ADHD to be identified by teachers as doing poorly in school. By the way, what's not clear from this study, are they actually doing poorly in school or are the teachers perceiving them to be doing poorly in school? Because one of the things that I think does happen, the teachers know who's medicated and they start to have lower expectations for those children and sometimes those become truer. Worse ADHD symptoms, what did Western Australia conclude? Medication does not translate into long-term benefits on any domains. This is just a small thing. Medicaid in our country is for poor children. And they looked at uh, ADHD children who got care versus children who were diagnosed who did not get care. And those who went to these expert uh, mental health clinics were more likely to have functional impairments at 6 and 12 months. In other words, care was uh, a marker for a poor outcome at the end of 6 and 12 months. This is a really interesting study that, to be honest with you, I don't quite totally understand the design, but here's the background to the study. So as you know, in Canada, there's different provinces, right? And even though they have national health insurance, the provinces make some decisions about uh, co-pays, that sort of thing. And in the mid-90s, Quebec passed a law where they, they, there was, I think, no co-pays. So as a result of that change in policy, all of a sudden you saw the use of stimulant medications go up in Quebec related to the other provinces. And so they thought, okay, we now have an isolated variable. Will this be a good thing that more kids are getting diagnosed for the society as a whole or a bad thing? And what you can see, as you can read, it led to more problems. So increased access to stimulants led to more problems in that society among its kids. You'll see medication associated with increases in, in unhappiness, deterioration in relationship with parents, more emotional and social effects among the girls, et cetera. We find that in increases in medication use are associated with increases in the probability that boys dropped out of school and with marginal increases in the probability that girls have ever been diagnosed with a mental or emotional disorder. It's, again, it's a negative, a different type of study, but as, as a society adopted this, it led to negative outcomes. Now, who's Alan Sroof? 
He's a psychologist that began investigating uh, minimal brain dysfunction and what became attention deficit disorder back in the 70s. He's been doing it for 40 years. He believed this was going to be helpful initially until he started really looking at the drugs. And finally, he said in 2012, yeah, they'll increase uh, some, some concentration over the short term in everybody. And now he's summing up 40, uh, 30 years of testing. When given to children over long periods of times, they neither improve school achievement nor reduce behavioral problems. To date, no study has found any long-term benefit of the medication on academic performance, peer relationships, or behavior problems, the very things we'd want most to improve. All drugs have risks and benefits, right? We're looking at the benefit side, and we're looking to see this very key question. Does getting diagnosed and getting treated with stimulants, does it help the children over the long term grow up and thrive? And that, as the evidence that you've seen reviewed here and summarized by Alan Sroof has said, no, we don't have that evidence. So I was given this talk uh, a, a, a while back, and a uh, psychiatrist got, stood up and got very angry with me. He said, that's not true. There's a new study out. And this is the new study that has been, I want to show you, I'm trying to canvas the literature, that is now being presented as evidence that these drugs work over the long term. And here was the study. They go into a Swedish national registry. They look at all the people over 15 that have the diagnosis. And then they look, based on their uh, drug database, whether those people uh, were taking stimulants during a two-year period. And what they concluded was this. They really end up with three groups. A small group of people who stayed on medication all the time, a group that never took medication, and then a group that went on and off, okay? And the group that went on and off uh, were more likely to commit a crime, okay, during that two-year period. And so we'll say these findings raise the possibility that the use of medication reduces the risk of criminality among patients with ADHD. So this is now cited as the reason you got to, even though they're over 15, at least in some of the places I've been. That's your long-term evidence. But you'll see, th th they don't really go into drug use. It's 52% use drugs, stimulants sporadically. It's in that group that has the increased problem of crime. And what do we know about going on and off drugs? You have withdrawal symptoms, right? So really, probably what I think you're seeing is here some of the problems associated with going off the drugs. And we really need the crime rate for all three. OK. now that's. That's long-term literature. Now let's go real quickly to the risk side of these drugs. The adverse events, what do you see? All sorts of physical problems, emotional depression, apathy, general dullness. Psychiatric, you get a lot of OCD symptoms. I think Peter Bregan's going to talk about this. You get some mania. You get some psychotic episodes. One study found about 6% over the course of a year hallucination, hallucinations. And of course, you have withdrawal symptoms. Going back to animal studies, let's medicate them, take it away. What do we see with these adult rats? We already said we don't see maybe a renormalization of the dopaminergic systems. But if we look at the behavior of the adult rats, we find deficits in their behavior. You see the deficits in, in sexual behavior, that finding? Here's what they find. You give a male rat a stimulant before they hit puberty, a little time during puberty, take it away, and then you watch what happens to that adult rat and what they do is they don't mount the female rats with the same sort of uh, sense of confidence. So they just count the number of times they're mounting the female rats. That's a, a deficiency in sexual behavior. But you'll see it's in monkeys too, okay? You're, you're getting the same thing, these aberrant behaviors. This is a summary. This is somebody looked at all the animal studies. Seems to provoke persistent neurobehavioral consequences, long-term modulation of self-control abilities, you see the next one? Decreased sensitivity to natural and drug reward and enhanced stress-induced emotionality. One of the worries is this. If you look at the monkeys and the rats that have been exposed, they become less curious. They become more fearful as adult animals. Think, and here's the worry. You go on a stimulant. It ups dopaminergic activity. That causes your dopaminergic system to go into the subsensitive state. And we know that dopamine is a reward, is part of our reward curiosity seeking uh, system. 
So maybe you make that subsensitive and you make a child less curious as an adult. This is one of the worries if you talk to these people. But the point is, animal studies show persistent brain abnormalities after exposure, and in adulthood, even after you quit the stimulants, um, these neurobehavioral consequences. Maybe it's different from children, I don't know, but you can see the worry there. You do not diagnose, I don't think you diagnose juvenile, do you diagnose juvenile bipolar illness much here now? No. You don't here. So in a way, this is an American problem, okay? But what's happening in the US is kids go on these stimulants, okay? Uh, someone will have a psychotic episode, they get the bipolar diagnosis, all right? And so now if you look at kids diagnosed with juvenile bipolar illness, you'll see often about two-thirds were first exposed to stimulant medications, okay? It becomes a pathway to bipolar. Once you get the bipolar in the United States, you get antipsychotics and you're said to be uh, ill for life. I just want to show you this thing. Again, you don't diagnose it. But what I did is, over here, I don't know how to even use this so that it shows up. Uh, anyway, I just looked at uh, what do you get in terms of stimulant-induced symptoms. You get these arousal symptoms, right? And then as the drug leaves the body, you get these dysphoric symptoms. You get this cycling during the day, right? And we all know this happens. So then I went to the NIMH website and I looked at what are the symptoms for bipolar disorder? <laughs> they map right on top of each other, okay? So they literally map on top of each other. The best I've seen about this, in one study, 12% of kids who had no signs of bipolar disorder uh, by Joseph Biederman standards, uh, before they went on stimulants, then had it after the end of two years. And roughly 25% of our kids on stimulants long-term now convert to bipolar. And when that happens, they're basically on a path to a career as a mental patient. So, risks and benefits. Benefits, if you look at that, the short-term study, some short-term reduction of ADHD symptoms. I'm about time, five minutes, that's perfect, because that's when I'll be done. <laughs> the possible short-term improvement reading, that's from that MTA study. I went ahead and put in this Swedish study. I think it's a pretty bad study, but I'll put it up there. That's on the positive side. What's harms? No long-term benefit on any domain of functioning. You saw that. We have all these physical, emotional, psychiatric adverse effects. The risk that the brain's dopaminergic system will become desensitized. We see that in the animal studies, et cetera. And in the US, be thankful your ADHD kids or kids being so diagnosed don't move on to bipolar. I can't believe we didn't export that to you. Just... <laughs> oh, they, get to, they move on to autism. And do they get antipsychotics with that autism? I'm not sure that's all that much better of a diagnosis. <laughs> Actually, though, you can see then what happens. Think about this. You're taking a kid. What, what's wrong with the kid? Well, they're running around too much, right? And I don't know how your classrooms are. In the United States, they have to sit in these damn seats so long now. They don't have gym. They don't have music. And then they go home and they have to do homework when they're seven years old. It's, 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 it's an impossible sort of standard. Anyway, you take a kid who's tapping his fingers and talking too much, and next thing you know, they've moved on to an autism diagnosis or a bipolar diagnosis. That's a really iatrogenic pathway, in, in my opinion. So Spanish investigators, and I'm pretty sure these investigators actually read Anatomy of an Epidemic, because what you see in this paper is they go back and revisit all these studies that I just reviewed for you. And just as a final thing is, so now they're coming up with clinical care guidelines for treating ADHD in Spain. So they go back and review the long-term evidence. And just read this. In my opinion, this is an evidence-based conclusion. Tools of last resort in a small number of cases and limited in short periods of time. And in the United States, we have about 10% of our kids, as far as I can tell, on medications now for ADHD, 13% diagnosed. And last thing here is this. This fits with what James was talking about, um, abnormalizing the normal. Uh, I recently spoke to uh, admissions counselors for small liberal arts colleges in, 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 in New England. 
And I asked them, how many of your kids now arrive at college with a diagnosis and a prescription? So these are 19-year-old kids in the United States, more or less. Any guesses? How much? 55. 85. Good God. OK, it's appalling, but it's not that appalling. OK, 12 would be appalling, but it's around 28 now. OK, and uh, we have about 50% of our college kids who now access uh, mental health services during college, which means they've, taught to not, they've been taught to not be resilient and to see themselves as having a mental problem. Final thing is this, in, in going back to the disability data. I went over my five minutes, didn't I? <laughs> OK. In 1987, there were 16,200 children in the United States who got a, a disability payment for their families because they were mentally ill. That was the thing. Then in, around 1992, they began uh, various advocacy groups, began advocating that if you have ADHD, you should get on disability. So now we have about 750,000 kids on disability. We went from 16,200 to, uh, to 750,000. What do you think happens to the kids who go on disability when they turn age 18? Two thirds go on to adult disability. So what we have now in the era of DSM-3 and DSM-4 is a new career path in the United States. <laughs> it sounds funny, but really they end up with careers as mental patients. So thank you.